Anyone who sat down to learn how to code for an extended period of time knows a few things about the process. First thing is that it's very difficult. Second is that it's time consuming. And the third is that it requires a lot of practice. This is accentuated even more if you're not in a college or boot camp learning to code, because on top of all of those aspects of learning, it can be a lonely process. And when you come across a particular difficult problem, you don't have a senior developer or a teacher to guide you through the process of debugging or troubleshooting or even giving you a different perspective on how things might be. Being in these situations can be frustrating, uh, lead to spinning your wheels for extended periods of time, and for the worst case, even quitting learning how to code at all. That's why if you're learning to code, especially if you're going the self-taught route, it's imperative to get a mentor to help you along the way. In this video, we're gonna talk about why you need a mentor for learning how to code and how you can find one for a reasonable price, if not free. So why do you need a mentor in the first place? If I were to sum it up in just one sentence, I would just say that mentors know things that you don't. The biggest benefit of mentors is in their technical know-how or being able to give you all the right answers to interview questions. The biggest benefit is that they provide clarity to you. They see things from the inside of the industry that you simply cannot see being an outsider learning how to code. Some of you may already know this, but I recently had a call with a new mentor of mine about the pros and cons of going the self-taught route and continuing to self-teach versus going to a coding bootcamp. He made a really poignant observation, which is this, it's January. That didn't mean anything of significance to me, but he further clarified that I'm now on a track, at least with like the general industry standards, where we're about six months out from peak hiring season. You may or may not know this, but about 45% of all hiring in the tech industry happens between the months of August and October in that two to three month span. That means that if I'm learning how to code and I want the best opportunity of becoming a developer in 2023, I should be really thinking about that six month time span as kind of my goal for being able to get really heavy into the interviewing process so I have the highest chance of landing that first junior developer position. Now, it just so happens that a lot of coding boot camps, especially on the part time side of things, offer a six month learning track where by the time you start and finish the program, it's, it's roughly six months and you've produced several high level projects and have done a reasonable amount of interview prep to the point where you're pretty much job ready to get into that junior position. General Assembly's bootcamp specifically is exactly six months on a part-time basis, working about 35, 30 to 35 hours a week, including out of class work. This was a big eye opener for me because while I'm not gonna be a full-fledged software engineer by the time I'm done with that bootcamp, I'm going to be in a position to be ready to start interviewing. Without that, I might've then found myself trying to apply for jobs in December, January, February with with limited results because most of the activity has already calmed down from the end of 2023. Mentors also know what to look for in a new developer candidate. Typically, at least a well-vetted mentor will be in a relatively high position and will have done a lot of technical interviews or conducted a fair few of technical interviews. And so, especially specific to their company, they're gonna know a lot about what goes into those interviews and what a junior dev should know getting into that first position. Essentially, mentors can see the flaws that you have that you may be blind to. It's really easy as somebody who's being self-taught to get really granular on the specific skills that you're learning and not take in kind of the 50,000 foot view of overall, what are the skills you're currently learning? How does it apply to landing that first job? And what do you need to improve on? Mentors are really good at pulling you up to that view and really seeing the overall objective of where you need to be focusing your time and energy. What you're ultimately paying for in a mentor is guidance and insight. The insight is the most valuable part of the mentorship experience. If you're interviewing a potential mentor and they're only talking about what they've done or they're only asking you specific questions about what you've done, at least for an extended period of time, it might be a good idea to consider hiring a different mentor. A mentor's job, don't get me wrong, can sometimes and often will be giving you technical and specific advice, but most of a mentor's job is to just basically pull your head out of your self-obsessed rear end 
to show you the larger picture of how things are working within the industry and how you can position yourself to properly enter it. When you've got your head down hustling, you naturally miss the bigger picture. It's just a result of getting really granular with things. And getting that 50,000 foot view on a regular basis will pay off huge dividends when it comes to getting into the industry. So what does a mentor cost you? The mentorship relationship can start at zero dollars and basically go up from there. Most formal mentors are going to either charge per session or there are online services that will charge you on a monthly basis for a specific mentor. You can totally get indirect help by simply attending an online program uh, that's self-paced. Zero to Mastery is the one that I have experience with. In their course, you have the specific course material, but then you also get access to the Discord, uh, which has a channel specific, it's called Help Me, where you can post questions that you have about the lessons that you're going through or problems that you're having debugging, etc., and other moderators or helpful participants will give you insight and help you kind of move along the way. They also have a career advice section, interview question section. So for those of you that are going the self-taught route and don't have that extra money to invest into a mentor, this can be a really good option, but it is definitely limited. It's limited in its access because you can't just schedule a call with somebody and have a 45 minute discussion about where you're at or what you're struggling with, but it is a pretty decent way to get some generalized help. This certainly isn't the most effective way to get mentorship, but it is a decent way to get a little nudge in the right direction, so it definitely shouldn't be overlooked. Then there's paid mentorships, which in my opinion are the most effective. I hired my mentor through Mentor Cruise, so we'll just look at that as an example. Mentorship rates start at about $50 a month and they go up from there. There's essentially no cap to what you can spend on a mentor. There are plenty of mentorships that run $500 or more per month. This is a huge range, obviously, so you can kind of work towards the lower end or upper end if you're looking for more calls a week or a more qualified mentor. And I totally understand that this can seem like a huge expense, especially if you're just working a regular job and just trying to pay the bills every single month. Stay with me here though, let's do a little bit of math and just see how this can potentially pay off if you're able to properly utilize the benefits of a mentorship. Let's split that cost down the middle and just say that you're spending $250 a month on your mentorship costs. On Mentor Cruise, this can get you reasonably uh, two or three calls a month. Uh, that are 30 to 45 minutes. It will also typically get you a good amount of CV or resume help and help getting your LinkedIn established. And then a lot of mentorship uh, calls can also turn into mock interviews as well. So you can get at least one mock interview a month done going this route. The market value on this service alone is quite great compared to other services. There's a ton of mock interview services online where you can get a mock interview with somebody who works at a fan company, which is a great benefit. But a lot of these mock interviews cost at least $150 sometimes, sometimes even two, $300 for a 90 minute interview, which is a really high price. With a mentor, if you are able to negotiate this particular service, you can get two, maybe even three mock interviews a month for a couple hundred dollars, which is a great deal. Having this early in your career and later in your career is a great way to practice common coding interview questions and get a big leg up when it comes to competing with other potential developers. And a lot of the time being able to ace these interviews is what's gonna land you that high-end position. If you're just beginning like myself, that might seem like a high price to pay, and that's totally a fair position to have. You might not even think it's necessary to have this extra help along the way because maybe entry-level employers are gonna be a little bit easier on these algorithmic problems. Employers can sometimes give a little bit more leeway on this side of things to people who are just starting out, but I would prompt you to investigate the benefit of time rather than money when it comes to utilizing a mentor. So real quick, let's do a little bit of math here regarding that time saving. If you spend $250 per month for a span of six months on mentorship, you're gonna be at a total cost of about $1,500 for mentorship in total. As long as you're vetting your mentors properly and utilizing their services well, that should give you a huge leg up with being able to approach technical interviews when the time comes to do so. So let's say that after six months, you're ready for the big leagues and you start applying to developer jobs and you begin to go through the interview process. If it takes you three additional months to land that first position, you're at a total mentorship cost of $2,250. And let's say that after that time frame, you're able to negotiate a salary with the help of your mentor, of course, of $75,000, which is a pretty reasonable average for a junior developer. It's not totally unrealistic at all. You'll be making $6,250 gross per month at your first position. 
At a 20% tax rate, this comes to $5,000 take home per month. That means if you have living expenses of $2,500 a month, you'll make up the difference of mentorship in your first month of having that new position. Comparing this to the self-guided route, you're saving a little bit up front totally. You don't want to discount the fact that you're saving the $2,250. That can be worth something, especially if you're living paycheck to paycheck, and that gives you a little bit more of a cushion to kind of fall back on if you have to. But what if not having a mentor results in an additional three months of job searching? That means you're taking personal time to study data structures and algorithms, and it just takes you a little bit longer to get into the position of being ready to interview. Three months might not sound like a lot of time, but in that time, you could have been working those three months. So by saving your $2,250 up front, you're actually sacrificing three months of pay, which comes to $15,000 take home. If you subtract the cost of mentorship in the, in the form of the money that you were able to save, you have a total of $12,750 that you're missing out on. And this is only accounting for the lost wages. This doesn't take into account any opportunity cost of having that job for three additional months and being able to get closer to your first promotion or your next developer job, which will pay you even more. In this way, the lost wages are pretty exponential, not linear. So how do you find a mentor? There's a couple of ways to do this. And the first one is through networking. You can establish relationships within your social network to find people that are willing to help you out. This is a great reason to get into coding meetups early on into your career. Getting out and meeting people is going to naturally get you around people that are more experienced than you and can have some indirect insight into how you might navigate getting into that first paid position. Specifically going to meetups that you don't feel qualified for is a fantastic way to get in touch with new people that know more than you do. Just by being around these people on a regular basis, you're going to naturally pick up things through osmosis that you wouldn't have otherwise been able to pick up on your own. This can organically create a relationship between you and somebody who knows more than you do, where they can potentially help you out with specific issues that you're looking at or actually give you specific guidance on how to make that next step into the first position. Personally, I think the in-person meetups are really underrated because on the internet, you can make a lot more impressions on a daily basis, but the amount of impact per impression that you can make on people when you meet them in person is much larger. So there's potentially a much bigger payoff for being able to actually go out and meet people. Now there's definitely downsides to the organic approach, primarily that it can be pretty touch and go. If you don't have something formal set up with somebody, it can feel a little awkward to ask them on a regular basis for help. Finding somebody who's willing to give you structured, high quality advice on a regular basis can be quite difficult. And this is why if you're gonna do it this way, you can definitely save money, but it's important to make sure that you're providing some kind of value to them in exchange. You have to think of a way you can give something to the mentor in exchange for their services. Maybe this person has a part of their work that's really redundant, especially if they're an entrepreneur. They probably have things on their plate that they would rather have off so they could focus on higher paying tasks specific to them. Another option is to just straight up offer to pay them, allowing them to accept payment from you, whether it's cash or you just doing them favors whenever you meet, buying them coffee, buying them lunch, whatever it is. This can be a really good way to kind of gain their trust and consistency and enthusiasm for helping you out. What's most important about this is that you even suggesting this, they are made aware that you value their time and it affirms to them that the effort that they're putting into you is of high value to you and that you're very grateful for that time and effort. And chances are, if they're reaching out to help you or even responding to you reaching out in, uh, in request for help and they're willing to move forward in the first place, they're not gonna be looking to gouge you for a few bucks in order to utilize a mentorship relationship with them. And if they do, then you know that it's probably not the right way to go. This also segues into the idea of getting into an internship. Now, there's a ton of black and white opinions on the internet when it comes to internships. Some people think that all internships are robbery and thievery and that you should not get involved in them at all. Uh, and other people think that it's frankly the only way to go to get into a paid position. I don't personally think either of these are absolutely true in Anyway, the value of internships kind of lie on a spectrum, really. The primary thing to be thinking about when it comes to getting involved in an internship is how well you can do it and what value it's going to provide for you on a mid to long term basis. So if I had a 
startup that was just beginning to get their wheels rolling and they wanted me to take a ton of workload off of their developers in exchange for a nominal amount of instruction, that would probably be something I passed up on. On the other hand, if Elon Musk or some other high level CEO asks you to help them uh, and uh, get them coffee and live on their lawn for three months in exchange for being able to pick their brain and see how they move through their day, I would hope most of you would take advantage of that opportunity because the potential long-term payoff on that is way higher than our initial example. Ultimately, when you're learning to code and trying to pursue getting a mentorship, the best tool that you have in your arsenal is your judgment. If you land yourself in a predatory internship or your mentor is clearly not providing that value or going the extra mile to make sure you succeed, you have to have the judgment to be able to fire them and find a better mentor. Sometimes this can only be learned by having a bad mentor and choosing to move on. This is inevitably probably gonna to happen to most of you, so you have to learn to trust the process. Whether you're just learning to code or you're already established in your career and you're looking to make a move into a higher paying position or a higher quality position, a mentor can be a huge benefit and give you years of insight that you don't have. Think of a mentor as a flashlight on a dimly lit trail. Without it, you have the potential to wander aimlessly and lose your way or at least only have a faint idea that the trail goes on somewhere in the distance. You have have to pay to buy the flashlight and you have to pay for the batteries that it takes to keep the flashlight working but the price for it is pretty low when you're able to illuminate the entire trail in front of you and really clearly see the direction you're going for a much farther distance. With a mentor, you have clarity. They can illuminate pitfalls in your trail and steer you in a better direction before you even hit them. And from a practical standpoint, if you find a mentor that's in a high quality company that you would like to be a part of one day, you have specific instruction and experience on your side when it comes to prepping for an interview, getting into the door in the first place and having a referral to that company potentially, and being able to navigate the company culture when you get into that position. In the end, I would prompt you to sit down with a pen and paper or type on your keyboard and ask yourself these two questions. What do I have to learn from getting a mentorship relationship started? And second, what do I have to lose by not establishing one in the first place? That's all for today. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you again soon.